Me on? All right. All right, guys, welcome to another 12 Petals Fireside Chat. Uh, I'm your host, Justin, as always. Uh, and this time we'll be talking about the challenges of being an educator. And um, we'll be going over a few different zones of topics, challenges facing students of the generation, uh, especially around COVID and online learning, the challenges coming out of it. Um, and also how our guests today, who are all very experienced teachers, have managed with these problems. Um, so I'll do a quick intro of who we have here today, uh, starting with Caroline Reyes. Uh, Caroline has her bachelor's and master's in heart performance and ethnomusicology from Eastman. Uh, she's also an active performer, having performed with many notable ensembles, including the Long Beach Symphony and the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. And she currently serves on the faculty of Los Angeles City College, helping students transfer out and get their bachelor's degrees. Uh, successfully, I might add, considering her last year, she and her team were able to help all the students except one transfer out. So yeah, she's, she's doing a good job. Thanks for joining us, Caroline. Um, Neil Reyes, Caroline's husband, has, he's, he's aspired to be a music teacher since he was very young, actually, uh, before he was even a teenager. Um, he majored in music education and, like Caroline, earned his bachelor's and master's from Eastman. Um, he taught in Rochester for five years before moving to Huntington Beach. He's been teaching full time for more than 10 years with students of all different ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds. So thanks for being with us, Neil. Um, Kitty Chung Chung, sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Um, Kitty uh, ha, uh, has had a versatile career as a violinist. She's a co-founder of Romer String Quartet and Contrast Trio and is an uh, adjunct lecturer at the Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, she was also the associate concertmaster of the Hong Kong Symphonia. Uh, she's also another Eastman grad where she got her undergrad and her doctorate. Um, and also has a double, uh, double master's from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. So she, she gets a lot of work done. Uh, Kitty, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Uh, and last but not least, Preston Bailey. Preston is a trumpeter based out of Nashville who performs regularly with the Nashville, Chattanooga, and Huntsville symph symphonies. He's also a first call studio musician in town having recorded soundtracks for video games like Destiny 2, Call of Duty, Fortnite, Spider-Man, Miles Morales, among many others. Uh, so if you're a gamer like me, you've probably heard some of his sounds. <laughs> um, he also teaches at middle school, or Middle Tennessee State University and Lipscomb University as an adjunct professor of trumpet. Uh, so thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you guys all for joining us. Um, and yeah, let's get started. You guys can un unmute yourselves. Um, so I don't feel so alone. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so, um, I think, I think the most interesting place to start would be, um, if some of you, or all of you, depending on what, how, how you feel resonant with the question, uh, could answer, what got you into teaching? Like what, uh, what got you into teaching? And that can kind of evolve into what, do you, what qualities about it do you love? And I think Neil, we can start with you because I think you have a pretty, pretty um, interesting beginning uh, 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 origin story. <laughs> um, if for me, I, yeah, I have, as far as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a teacher. Um, uh, since I was 12 years old, I've always thought that I'd be a good educator, uh, music educator. Um, it started out, I, I was growing up in Singapore and it started out in the, my band experience um, where I was a junior um, at this point and uh, I was helping out a freshman uh, figure out some rhythms. And I had a chance to sit down with them one-on-one -on -one, and we did a couple of movement activities to help them understand um, quarter notes versus, or crotchets versus uh, quavers, that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> 
and uh oh and so i at that point when i was teaching that uh or helping the the student understand that concept through movement um th there was this thing in, in me like oh my gosh i love this feeling of helping someone um yeah just understand music altogether and uh yeah it, like that it, yeah it clicked i i just yeah that's uh that's how it started <laughs> Yeah, I remember. I remember when we were talking about it earlier. Um, it, it was really seeing it, it, that that particular moment when they when they get it after not having gotten it. Um, yeah. sh sharing in that win. Right. Yeah. So you like you I, until this very day, because my um, the uh, group or the age group that I serve uh, are sixth to eighth graders. And um, a couple of years back, I also had a chance to serve kindergartners all the way to eighth grade. Uh, but now I'm just in middle school. So I have that six, seven, and eighth graders. So that's 12, 13, and 14 year olds. And even at that age, I mean, just seeing them uh, when that light bulb lights up or when something clicks, you can see it in their face. You can't hide it. You can't hide that, that, that look of, of uh, amazement or wonder and uh, contentment. You know? Anybody have uh, similar experiences or 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 uh, contrasting experiences? I guess I can go. Um, so you know, Neil and I had kind of very different um, entryways into music education, and uh, you know where he really from a long time ago. This is what he wanted to do, and for me, it kind of. fell into my lap a little bit. I never really intended to be a music educator when I was going through my own education. That wasn't really on my radar, not really something I wanted to do. And um, as I was going through my graduate degrees, uh, especially some teaching opportunities opened up for me. And that's really when I realized that it was a really fulfilling thing for me to do. And um, yeah, so that was kind of how I got into it. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes sometimes you, you have it and sometimes it just comes to you. Yeah. Um, hold on. Yeah, I, I um, Preston, you were also talking about earlier um, uh, how there was uh, how how the music the music teaching was a, was secondary to to your enjoyment of of, of teaching or not necessarily yeah. enjoyment but but uh, but um, sorry I'm losing my words right now. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, music is secondary. Uh, music is secondary. You're talking about how being a positive adult role model <laughs> was um, was uh, was an important part of your your teaching career. Yeah, I think Neil already put it really well. But I had a similar experience when I was a senior in high school. We had this fluff class that was senior project, and it was like it could be literally anything you wanted it to be. Uh, so I chose to go to the local middle school and teach lessons and that was the first time I'd ever really you know sat down in a, a constructed sort of way and tried to help people uh and m again much like Neil already said like you get that first kind of light bulb moment where somebody goes oh I didn't know that it could be like that and you go wow this is a really this is a really powerful feeling and there's a connection there and uh I, yeah, getting back to what you were asking me about, my my trumpet teacher in my undergrad, uh, more than being a great teacher and a great trumpet player, he was a great human being. Uh, he went above and beyond for all of us in the studio, but myself included, uh, just in the four years that I was there, it was very much like that father figure and mentor. And, and uh, that whole time, you know, I'm teaching private lessons kind of on the side to help pay the bills while you're in school it's either that or work at Applebee's it's like well I'll teach lessons at least <laughs> it's sort of related to my career uh and then you you just get to see that the you know I'm, I'm gosh I think I'm like 14 years removed from graduating college something like that 
shockingly getting older and older. How's this keep happening? I, uh, I sit there and when I reflect on my undergrad, it's not the lessons that I had, it's the, the experiences that I had, the moments, the conversations. And, and when I think about teaching students, it, it, those are the things that I hope they remember. Because obviously, you know, not every 10 year old that I have is gonna play their way into New York Philharmonic, that's fine. Not everybody needs to play beyond the high school, but you're, you're hopefully teaching this appreciation for music. But more important than that, I want them to be able to look back 20 years from now and you know oh yeah I remember that funny bearded guy that used to teach me trumpet lessons he made me laugh he was a good guy and hopefully they pay it forward and then you know the world becomes a better place in a, in a perfect world but yeah yeah that's so important I, I think the the um because because especially in in the states and I don't know if it's 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 more of a global thing as well but just you know the 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 nuclear family like the the child that being raised by just two adults um doesn't work like you you need to have a diversity of perspectives and it also have so many good adult role models um so so i think, feel like music is such a great um platform or a channel where where those kinds of relationships can form um kitty i know you started teaching as a teacher's assistant or was it was it helping your mom's students I, I, I forget where exactly the story yeah. is um well when I was uh, when I was a teenager before college um I I would hang out at my mom's studio when when she was teaching that's that's like my grow up place I spend more time in her studio than than in my home um so, so uh, she, as I progressed with my violin and music, she uh, took advantage of that. And uh, whenever she needed a bathroom break or need a snack break or needs a break in general, she said, oh, Kitty, can you help out and just attend to my student for a couple minutes? And that's how, how I started. Um, at the time, I didn't really realize that that was a teaching experience. I, I just thought I was helping out with chores, um, <laughs> <laughs> and and so I. It was interesting because my mom is a pianist and I'm a violinist, and I I hardly play any piano. It's just um, sitting behind her um, uh, and watch her teach throughout the years, uh, absorb things, and then I would just repeat what her what she said, how she would. Uh, um, how she would interact with her students. So I, I just helped out with the practicing part basically while, while she would go away for a couple of minutes. And that's, that's how I first started teaching. And then, um, yeah, and then after that, um, I went um, to study music obviously and, and uh, my old violin teacher um, in Hong Kong, uh, Every summer she has, she she has a U.S. home. She a summer home. So every summer she would um, leave Hong Kong for, for like two months. So I would be substituting her for the entire summer, teaching her students. So so that was my early training in in uh, lessons. And those were really fun because I I wasn't really teaching my very own students. Uh -huh. Had to had to figure out what they have been working on and how how things might work with them. That was really cool. So what what did you what did you um what what was it like when you first like were were you comfortable at when you first started te teaching in that way or, or yeah. was it? okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know you know how kids just copy what their parents do uh -huh. so I was just basically mimicking my mom's teaching you kind of had a template a template to work with yeah okay um okay i think so this kind of leads me to be a little bit more curious because we we talked about how uh how music can can be secondary to to the good teaching experience but i'm also um curious as to um well, so I'm curious as to what you guys think 
uh, what role you think music plays in your students' lives? Um, uh, just in terms of how it affects their lives as they're learning music. But to kind of get there, I'm, I'm curious as to how you guys feel that that being educated in music has, has enriched your own lives. Um, Preston and I were talking earlier about how uh, how um, different different crafts and different teachers of different crafts uh, impart certain principles. Um, we were talking earlier about the athletes, um, like 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 a, the honor and respect and discipline of like a jujitsu teacher, um, or maybe the creative visual expression of of a, of a painting teacher. Um, I'm curious as to what, what you guys feel has, has been uh, enriching in your lives from being somebody who's been educated in the skill of music. Um, any of you guys can, can take that, whoever, whoever feels it. Well, I think one of the things is um, sort of like, I think that practicing music actually is very similar to athletics in the discipline and, um, you know, often the teamwork as well. I think they're both really important when you are learning music and making music. Um, one of the things that I think is so challenging with music education and also, you know, being a musician is how um, how self-driven it needs to be sometimes. You know, when you're rehearsing with a group, then you have that great team mentality, which is great. But then, you know, the bulk of your time as a musician is spent alone in a room and trying to keep yourself motivated, keep yourself disciplined and have, you know, clear goals is something that, you know, I think is so important to develop as a musician, especially as a young musician. And it's one of those things that I try to train my young or new students to do. And um, yeah. Yeah, those are very important skills for just life in general. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really important. Um, anybody else? I'm going to piggyback on that too, because um, for the really young kids, um, or at least the teams that I'm putting together in the middle school, they, I, I mean, I'm hoping that they realize that what they give is part of the whole. And so having this um, uh, realization and mentality that if they're working on it by themselves, ultimately it's gonna be shared with the whole. And that experience becomes more wholesome. Oh my gosh, I keep saying that. <laughs> yeah, and, um, but I, I think um, for a lot of them, uh, they, they enjoy that. And I, I think for a lot of them, they know that too, because um, when, you know, as a teacher, I ask them every now and then, a 12 year old say, hey, did you practice last night? If the answer is yes, it, it, there's conviction in their yes, most of the times. And if you ask them why, that's the um, uh, second part question, they usually uh, would tell them like, I don't want to let the team down or something like that. Or I don't want to, um, or I, I wanna uh, give positively to the team. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I, I think that's where we're at at least with my, my teams, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. I wanted to add on to that a little bit um, with some of my own experience because I have sort of two kind of disparate musical lives, <laughs> sort of. Um, you know, I am a harpist primarily, that's what I went to school for. And as a harpist, it's a very solitary life. Um, it's mostly a solo instrument. Sometimes you get to play with a group, but even if you're playing with an orchestra, 
you're usually by yourself. You don't really have a section, like if you were to play violin or something like that. So it can be hard to find that connection with other musicians um, when you are a harpist and other instruments too, like pianists, I know kind of deal with a similar thing. Um, and then as I was going through my undergraduate, I joined the Balinese Gamelan Ensemble at Eastman and really fell in love with it. And one of the things that I loved so much about it is that it was completely different than what I was used to, because now you're in a group where you can't actually practice by yourself effectively because there is no part in that group that can exist by itself. And so you need to have that community every time you want to go practice. And um, so that was a really eye-opening thing for me and, you know, really opened my eyes to this whole other side of music making that I hadn't known before. It was really cool. And did you, did you feel like, like, was it, um... Was it easier to be motivated to practice in that in that configuration? Sort of. I mean, when I first started that group, it, since it was so new, I was terrified to practice. <laughs> I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but the other great thing about it is that almost everyone in that group is also a beginner and they've never even seen these instruments before. And so that really helped us to bond as well because um we are all at this prestigious music school we've all been studying music for years and years and we're pretty much already experts on our primary instrument and now we're being thrown into this completely new type of music with a different form with different instruments and nobody has any idea what's going on and um it was really great for um, all of us to learn music again, really, all over again. Mm. Great. Mm. So it was a beginner experience and there was like a strong interdependent, interdependent feeling. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, How do you feel like, um, well, actually, let me think about this. Um, I, I, I remember, Kitty, I remember you talking about, and this can kind of segue into what I want to talk about next, which is kind of um, the challenges of, of Zoom education. But, but Kitty, I remember you were talking about um, the, when you're teaching, um, you have a lot of awareness of awareness, like um, where where to direct your students' focus. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Like, do you think like how do you think that just the kind of the directing or the conducting of a student's uh, focus and attention and what they pay attention to? uh might do for their lives uh, um i guess the starting point of that would overlap with the motivation part of um what caroline was talking about um because um in order to be self-motivated self-motivated you have to be a, a fully aware of why you need to be motivated and, uh, and, and having that um, awareness would, would, would uh, direct a student to a, a certain way of practicing or, or what, what you really need to be working on or how it relates back to your life. Because um, I, I teach students of, of all ages, basically. The youngest is three and the oldest is a retired lady. And um, I, so, so they, they all come to lessons with a different purpose. Um, and, and some, I feel um, some of them 
come to lessons not knowing exactly why they're here, especially the younger ones. And uh, I feel um, as soon as they realize that what they learn in music as in their way of thinking, their way of processing material, um, and then how the, the, the music, say, say understanding the background of the music would help them relate to their, their teammates or their society, um, their history, their background, or, or just, just anything, uh, their subjects, something that they might be really, um, interested in. Um, like, like I have a kid who, who's obsessed with cars. So, so every lesson we talk about how, how every, every technique that you work on is related to, somewhat related to how you analyze um, a car, car driving technique. Uh, yeah, so, so, so oh, having- wait, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Unpack that first a little bit. I'm curious about how, <laughs> how, uh, how playing violin relates to, to driving cars. <laughs> or what, what what analogies you can draw? Um. Well, well, like like when you do shiftings or, or bow changes, is is you you can't really see it, but you yeah. you have to feel it, and it's so similar to knowing what's on the road and knowing what what to do with your steering wheel and the the gear shifting, simple things. Um. But but they like students often rely on teachers to, to provide techniques and instructions. And they, they kind of expect you to do, do it this way. But, but as soon as you provide the, inform the, 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 the link between what they truly understand and are pa passionate about, and then and show them that this is not really how you work on music, um, you, can, you can learn about um, different techniques by 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 like reading user menu and doing researches, but the the best way is to experience it firsthand. And so, uh, and so it's yeah, and and having that awareness um, to it to the point where you can relate it to things that you are truly passionate about, maybe um, it's a. It's a crucial part, and and then and then they would um, eventually, hopefully, um, be more aware of their psychological state of mind, um, how they would process. It's almost like um, seeing yourself from the moon, being able to see yourself from the moon, and and be able to direct and conduct um, how you progress, and just just be be very neutral and uh, uh, objective about your learning. So, so it's a subjective and objective um, learning process. And uh, yeah, so, so that is something that I would that, that, Yeah, that idea of finding a connection between an already existing passion in them to music is that that resonates hard with me because I I I was a I was like a cliche Asian child raised playing piano and violin from like six and I never liked it or I never like I didn't I don't really get music I kind of enjoyed it more for like it it was like oh I know what I have to do and I can do it and it was just kind of more like a problem solving type of satisfaction versus a feeling satisfaction but it wasn't until middle school when I started watching anime and hearing all these like anime songs that were like piano or violin solos and I was like oh I can play that and and I can I, and, and as I'm playing it I'm remembering the scenes from the anime that are very emotional and it's very different from my detached uh, uh, engagement with classical music um, so so that's I feel like that's that's so key, like like being able to create that bridge between well, first finding out what they're passionate about if if they don't seem to be naturally passionate about music, and then being able to to find ways to relate to that. Um, 
I'm going to kind of jump. It's going to seem like a jump, but I'm going to, I, I think it's going to relate back to, back to where we are. Um, um, I'm curious as to what, what struggles or challenges you guys have been having with, um, with, with teaching students over, um, over the pandemic. And also, um, after talking to you guys, it also sounds like not, not really during the pandemic. Well, during the pandemic, yes, but also there seems to be another kind of challenge of the transition between coming out of the pandemic and back to back to uh, physical lessons. Um, so I guess for this next part of the fireside chat, I, I would just like everybody to air their grievances and just lay out all the problems and, and what you guys are struggling with in that realm. Are there any union well, reps here? You should be listening. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll voice a really unpopular opinion, which is that uh, my wife encouraged me to launch this Zoom-based private lesson platform during the pandemic. So it's it's moved my life from having to drive in person to three different schools, you know, during the week to teaching with my sweatpants on. So uh, God knows the pandemic's been miserable and I, you know, this is not a good thing by any stretch of the imagination, but I've really enjoyed teaching on Zoom. I know that's going to be a hot take for you, Neil. I can't imagine what it's been like, and we'll hear very shortly about what it's like teaching middle school band via Zoom. <laughs> you deserve more money than you're getting paid, I promise. <laughs> but for me, it's really been this incredible opportunity to, to work with people that I would have never met without the internet. I have students uh, in Canada, the UK, California, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Texas, all over. And it's just yeah. been, it's been really awesome. Uh, again, we're all seeming to hit on the same points, which is that the, the connection between human beings is so much more pivotal and, and interesting than working on your C minor scale. <laughs> and it's just kind of opened up this really, uh, um, it's just allowing me to meet so many different people than I ever would have through music, which I guess is kind of the unifying thing there. But uh, for me, I don't really have any grievances, at least from the trumpet perspective. If you do just a little work kind of tweaking the mic settings and everything, I, I feel really confident that I can hear enough feedback to know, okay, this is happening. So you need to do this or vice versa. I don't really have any struggles with Zoom teaching with the exception of your occasional 12 year old boy who thinks he's outsmarting me while he's playing a game on the computer, but I see the light flash on his face. It's like, <laughs> dude, you're not fooling anybody, man. <laughs> I know you're not listening to me. So with, with that one caveat, I, I, I really enjoy teaching on Zoom. So I'll throw it to Neil so he can tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> um so in my experience uh teaching on zoom so beginning band was the worst class to teach on zoom beginning band was um just not having to be there for them uh so let's put it this way i had two uh band classes during the pandemic one of them the advanced band and all of them are experienced players they've had me in person um two years ago and all these other things so they they essentially, they were able to hang with me online uh, and we used a bunch of programs to make sure that we're still making music and even virtually we were able to make music together as a group through Soundtrap uh, as we layered sounds. Um, really cool program if you want to check it out. Uh, with the beginning band, uh, so let's put it this way, we got two groups in the beginning band. Uh, some of them have experience playing an instrument. Um, not a whole lot, but some. And then there are those who are brand new to an instrument. And let's put it this way. I did not have any of my scholars from last year who were brand new to the instrument come back to continue their experience in band this year. Yeah. So it's, it's essentially, it, it was that bad. And um, I, I had to get over that quick. Because <laughs> as a teacher, that was heartbreaking. Like I, yeah. So yeah. Oh yeah, man! It's Goodwill yeah. Hunting. It's it's not your fault, Neil. It's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Come here, give me a hug. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> right? Yeah, oh, but uh, and this year, it's just the night and day. I mean, just like being there with them, having them make mistakes in front of me and having them fix or not just fix, but like tackle those mistakes uh, in front of me. It's, oh my gosh, it's just like so much easier to support them and be there for them. Um, like teaching uh, clarinetists to make sure you're covering your home keys correctly and all these and it's like it's like impossible on zoom especially if they're beginners beginner um where they're putting together the instrument am i doing this right mr reyes and they're like trying to show me on this small little screen <laughs> and it's like um i think <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was challenging. It really was. And so um, I, I'm glad at least, yeah, some of them who had experience before they came back uh, and they're playing and they're playing well. And in my beginners this year, um, yeah, they're, they're playing well also. So yeah, it, it's, it's been challenging. Um, and then I, I was talking to Justin also a little bit about this where, um, so not just uh, issues with the students, but also with the community as well, meaning like uh, right now that we're transitioning back into in-person, there seems to be this, there's, there's the, uh, this need to reframe what music education or the value of music education can be about. Um, because I had this weird feeling uh, or uh, just uh, that parents are imposing this sort of mentality that music is a luxury. And, and I, I, I don't know, I just, that, that rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> it's like growing up uh, um, using music to connect and heal and uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, there's this huge uh, um, roadblock, I guess, um, to move forward in, in terms of making sure that music is uh, reaching the lives of the students that I serve or like the community that I serve, you know. Yeah, um, for me, teaching online was a mixed bag, is a mixed bag, because I still am teaching uh, one of my classes online. Uh, teaching harp on Zoom is awful. Probably, like it would probably be good and it would probably work if the students have, you know, the right setup with, you know, an actual camera, an actual microphone, something like that, just because the way the harp is, even when you're teaching a lesson in person, you have to constantly be like circling around them to make sure that everything is working properly. You can't look from one view to see if things are good. So, you know, I definitely have students coming out of having a year plus of Zoom lessons with some really terrible technique issues that they didn't have before. Uh, so that has definitely been a challenge. Um, but at the same time, I teach one class at LA City College that is, um, it used to be sort of a concert series, but since we moved online, especially, it moved more towards discussion and guest presentations and being online has been wonderful for that because I've been able to connect my students in Los Angeles with people I know from all around the country, all around the world, all of these great musicians to give them really good insight. And that's actually been really inspiring for the students. And um, I've also learned a lot because you know we were hearing from these working musicians as they were going through the pandemic and how they were continuing to work and making connections with people that they've never met uh, doing session work remotely um, sending their tracks off to you know bulgaria or whatever um, and so it's been really interesting to hear about how the entire music industry has changed in such a short period of time just out of necessity and um, I think that there are actually a lot of things that we could keep from this time. I, I don't think that we need to necessarily rush back to exactly how things were before. 
And I know that, um, I think Justin, you were referencing something that I had brought up about the challenge of coming back in person. So the school where I teach, there was a lot of student input about whether or not to come back in person, of course, because they're college students and they decide whether or not they're going to enroll in the classes. So we wanted to know uh, if we offered this class, would you rather have it in person or online? And while everyone was at home, they had opinions and a lot of them wanted said that they wanted to come back in person for a lot of things. But when it came down to it, a lot of our students really struggled to make that decision to come back. And it seems to me, um, since I advise a lot of students on their entire educational plan, that they are really stuck and kind of frozen in this really weird liminal place where there's pandemic land, where everything's online that they don't like, and didn't do well in their classes and they're really struggling on this side, but then they also have this fear of the unknown of going back because even if they don't like the online stuff, now they've gotten used to it. And so we have a lot of students who are struggling to stay engaged in our music program because they can't decide between, you know, the bad thing that they're used to and the scary thing that they don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I can see that being, being a struggle. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I remember, um, I remember Cutie, you were talking about how there was a, there was a difference in the mindset between uh, or, or there's a difference in what what they should be what your students should be paying attention to while they're in a Zoom lesson versus when they're with you in a physical room um, and how you were struggling with with getting them to pay attention to the right things. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um. In Zoom lesson, they 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 look at this little screen. Um, it's like looking into the mirror, but it's not really them themselves because you you never look into. That. That's what you said actually, Justin. You 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 look into the screen, but you're not looking at yourself. You're looking at the other person, but the other person's not really looking at you. It's kind of like a little <laughs> off. <laughs> Yeah, never have a contact. <laughs> you, you never quite a, have a direct interaction. It's always a miss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and that that part um, uh, it, I think I think because because I was I was um, thinking of the awareness thing and uh, it feels like it is is a little tough a little challenging for them to really know uh well you know how how your sound your projection has has to be related to to your surrounding and, and so when you're thinking about getting into the microphone that's that's a completely different way of playing um to when you play in a concert hall and so um it's it's a what after say one year of, or a couple of months of playing into the, the camera and the teacher giving you feedback of whatever they, they see or hear from the microphone and um, coming back to reality, they, they, it seems that they, they have this little missing link of, of realizing um, they have to change the way of playing to um, fit the change of environment. Um, so, so for us, uh, it's, we, we would easily understand it because it, it would be equivalent to thinking how to make a recording versus a live performance. Mm -hmm. But for them, um, because they're not at the stage where they have 
a lot of performance opportunity quite yet. And it's it's still one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it's a little bit hard of a concept for them to grasp um, why they need to make the changes and, and how, how would that be different, especially these days, kids, um, virtual and reality are one thing to them and for us it's still there's still a little bit of a separation we we still are able to distinguish distinguish the gap um so so it's a little harder for them to be emotionally more connected because i know i know with our age group and with our experience we we are very very much focused on especially um we, like a lot of us are Eastman trained and, and our school focuses so much on connection, community. Um, I feel it's a lot more challenging for kids who are separated from their classmates, like lacking that one um, that 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 experience in that in in their crucial part of life. And then you're asking them to connect. Um, in a one-on-one -on -one situation, trying to imagine what it's like to perform. And uh, for, that's a real big challenge for me, I feel. Especially for, for those who are preparing themselves to be professional musicians. I think for kids, it's okay. Like, you, you don't have to worry about that. But uh, for those who are, who are, who are like in, the, in their undergrad training, um, I, just, I just worry a little bit that if, if they play this way, for their, say, audition for grad school. It's, it's gonna be difficult, unless it's gonna be um, uh, online audition, which we have no idea. That might happen. Yeah, but yeah, just, just um, knowing exactly what to teach them and how to prepare them for the unknown world. And uh, like, whether they would be able to know exactly how to interact and be spontaneous about the, the future environment that they will Could it freeze for you that guys? A big challenge. Sorry, could you froze for a second? You said, uh, what's a big challenge? <laughs> <laughs> um, just just being able to know exactly how to how to prepare them for their future, because their future is unknown. So you don't know if they're gonna be focused more on the online situation or the real person or both. And Again. Oh no! You back? <laughs> <laughs> okay, nothing uh, important. <laughs> no, 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 we, 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 we got the the general idea though. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the the the, the connection the connect, connection thing is huge. Like regaining your sense of the importance of connection. Um, I remember we were talking earlier about. Uh, uh, you, you, for example, were, were, were emphasizing breathing um, as a form of communication to, to sync up with, with, with other performers, um, paying attention to response um, and like the real time reactions of the people around you. Um, and that can be something that comes out of habit if you're playing to a Zoom computer where you never make eye contact with anybody. Um, so I can see that, I can see that clearly being a struggle. Um, so that's a lot of problems. Interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, the interesting thing about the eye contact thing, I can completely understand why it's problematic in a lot of areas. But if you have like a 12 to 16 year old boy, like asking, hey, can I look at your face is like a really uncomfortable thing to, but when you're talking about embouchure, that's really important. So what I've found is that all of my much younger kids, they're like, oh, it's like you're saying, there's this disconnect with it. it's a virtual world. So they're, they'll get as close to the camera as I need them to. And they're happy to like, so there's, there's a, a little bit more freedom in, in a lot of ways to like really kind of uh, adjust technique and embouchure and things like that. It's one of the, one of the very first things that I noticed is even myself is like, I feel much more comfortable getting really close to this camera and showing you what my corners look like or, or whatever the case may be. Versus if I was in a room, I would never get this close to you because that, that would be really bizarre human behavior. So there, that's another just, I guess maybe I'm learning that the trumpet is like a oddly unique uh, instrument when it comes to, to online because they're, 
I, I never even considered what it would be like to teach a harp lesson. <laughs> I mean, unless you have like, you know, a camera crew circling you. My goodness, what a what a problematic <laughs> thing. So it's just it's giving me food for thought too. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Kitty, I think you were talking also about how, how you noticed that. I think it was you. Uh, I hope it was you. Um, how you uh, how Zoom was Zoom lets you be able to pay attention to your students' faces more than would be socially, normally socially. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they like if if you if you um are looking at the music and then side by side to them, um you wouldn't be actually play paying it. I think that's the biggest. It's it's good that we 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 have different instruments and and we have different experience because for you, um like Preston, you 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 have fo that focus, but for us, I focus so much more on on the 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 setup and not so much on the face. Um, unless it's in Zoom, and and I noticed the student frowning or making faces, um, or 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 even like seeing seeing them looking at the music and no kind of spotting how they read the music, no, and uh, and uh, that 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 was a good feedback actually, um, and and little kids because I uh, I use FaceTime with them. Uh, for the little kids, and they're able to <laughs> give me emojis. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really cute. So, so, do you understand? And they will give me a thumbs up or, or like <laughs> happy face and like clapping. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> that's cute. Yeah, that's so cute. That's so cute. Yeah, I, I was just laughing at just just imagining what it'd be like to be a student and your teacher's next to you and they're just looking at your face while you're playing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How uncomfortable that would be. A little weird. <laughs> yeah, a little weird. But but uh, as you guys describe, as you guys describe, it sounds like it's it's actually very valuable information as a teacher. Um to, to be able to see all that, see all that going on in them. Um yeah, that's really interesting. So okay, so right now we're kind of talking about the the surprising uh, uh, advantages of, of virtual learning, uh, which I would like to come back to. But first, I would kind of like to go back to some of the problems we were talking about, and then um, what are the what 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 are some of the solutions that you guys have been have been uh, using to address those. Preston, it doesn't sound like you have. It sounds like you're kind of having a good time with it. Um, yeah. Um, but you can elaborate in your own way. But I do want to start actually with um, with. Uh, oh wait, I have my notes on all these screens, um, and I remember what I was going to talk about, but I don't remember where it was. Oh, uh, Neil, you're talking about how how impactful just the question of um, how are you feeling or how are you doing was with your students as, as they were kind of. Um, struggling with with uh, re-socializing, I think. Yeah, I um, was um, worried about uh, building fundamentals, but when I say fundamentals, um, I'm talking about uh, character building. Actually, it's one of the questions in, in the chat because um, uh, uh, I've noticed that um, a lot of the kids coming back, so they're getting used to their environment again. They're getting used to the workload again. Um, and uh, a lot of them, uh, I felt they are lacking the, um, not just motivation, but just tools in general to be okay to begin with. Um, so sitting them down and asking them, well, then how are things? Like, how are you feeling? And so I would have them vocalize essentially how they're feeling. Um, so a quick exercise I would do with my kids is um, to have them show me with fingers, uh, one to five, one, Right now your school year needs a restart and let's go find that reset button or a five, like it's absolutely perfect. You don't want anything to change. And I've found, I, I've asked this question to all my classes. Um, I teach about like 200 and some students a week and um, in all of them, yeah, I would get like a lot of twos and threes. So it's pretty low. Their motivation is pretty low. Um, and they're talking about various things like um, uh, things like uh, grades right now, they're trying their best to like put up grades and they're worried about expectations on them, um, either 
from their parents or even themselves. Um, and then also there's a lot uh, of other kids who are talking about uh, problems with their families. And also it's, it's really outside of music, um, to, to be honest. Uh, but um, somehow that airing of grievances <laughs> has uh, brought all of them closer because now um, all of a sudden they uh, are able to see each other and say, oh, we're vulnerable and we're doing this together and we're all in this together. And um, somehow I found that that connection straight away helps them work better together. And I feel like right now, for example, um, even this today there, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like there's, there's this cohesion um, with them as a team when they make music because uh, there's that baseline of understanding that everybody is sort of struggling, but at the same time making it happen. Yeah, it's hard to explain. <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining it well. Yeah, but uh, just like, for example, that question that was posted in the chat, like how do you reckon that we develop and build one's character without over-focusing on assessments and achievements? So I guess it depends because like, I remember at Eastman, the training that I had over there, we were talking about hidden curriculum uh, and the hidden curriculum are the things outside of the actual skills that you're trying to teach your kids. And so if we're talking about assessing the hidden curriculum, that's sort of like, really difficult to do because <laughs> like how do we quantify for example the level of connection that you've had with this particular person like what is is it a rubric is there <laughs> is it uh yeah can it be objective or is it going to be yeah so it's it's kind of hard and then in terms of character also there's so much to pick from in my opinion um uh, even like uh just having that ability to talk to someone and connect with that person, that could be a character. Uh, so then how do you rate that? Like from one to five, how well did I do with you guys today? You know, like it's that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, it becomes quite difficult. Yeah. <laughs> wait, so wait, hang on, talk about Chris, Christina's like a 10 and everybody's like a five. I'm like, okay, I'm like halfway there, right? <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, so yeah, it's it's it it, it it could be tricky in my opinion. Um, if you're gonna assess a uh, character building, uh, but but I do know as a teacher that I, I feel it. I meaning like I see it in the kids, like especially again that cohesion. Uh, when they go through something, it's an adversity, and they have to get over it as a team. And then when they do so, are they celebrating? Are they taking those small little victories? And if they are, that shows me that okay, um, I think we're on the right track. So yeah and, and yeah all excellent points and I, i'm glad that you mentioned this question because i do think it's a really important thing to talk about uh i'm sure in every state but especially in tennessee all the students care about is mid-state you know your district bands like what chair did i get what band did i get in uh and it's just such a it's in our perspective way down the road you can understand sorry to say just how little those mean in the moment you know it's it's really not the end all be all that we make it out to be in high school so I think it is really important that you just have a very frank conversation with your students and and say these these five minutes in this audition does not define your musical year or your musical four years in school uh, I always try to equate uh, learning with my students to growing plants you know uh, my job is to help you plant the seed right uh, and if you cram for this audition, it's like watering your seed for 24 straight hours. It doesn't grow any faster. In fact, you just killed it because <laughs> you overwatered your plant. So uh, to me, and this, this definitely comes from my own experience of I, I'm a very diligent daily practicer. I haven't missed a day of practice in 14 years. Part of that's most of that is because it's how I make my living. I understand and I always tell my kids, like, you don't feed your family by the way you play the trumpet, right? I sure hope not. You're 10. There would be something off with your family. And they always laugh. And then they, so you can take some of the burden of expectation off of your playing. Uh, and I think just trying to, to give yourself ownership and understanding that this is something I'm going to do. And every day I can feel like I'm getting a little bit better. The, the, the focus, you know, it's that very cliche thing but it really is the journey because with music we all know there is no destination I, i'm never done learning i'll never have accomplished you know <laughs> the end game credit sequence of trumpet it's it's this constant thing and it takes a really specific kind of person 
to, to be willing to do that. You sit in a room by yourself for hours a day, understanding that I'm on a journey with no finish line. And whether it's right or wrong, that, that certainly when you get to a professional level, that definitely weeds out a lot of people. But my hope is for, for students who are in middle school and high school that what they find along that journey is, okay, I may, I may have stopped playing, but my love of music is continuing and maybe I'll support the arts or maybe I'll just go to concerts or maybe I'll just listen to movies a little bit more closely and see how the music relates. So the, the journey for all of us never stops, but the, the focusing on those honor bands, that's, that's like it's this pothole in that journey, or it's this detour where you just get so sidetracked that you're, you're suddenly in the, in the woods. And it's like, you gotta get back to the thing where I'm doing this. Like we all did it. Cause it was fun to make joyful noise when we first started. So that, that would be my, the way I would focus on somebody's character is just, just try to take it out of the equation, frankly, would not to say that you don't audition for those things, but just the, they're, they just don't matter as much as do you enjoy playing your instrument did you get better while you were working towards the audition all those things are way way more important mm -hmm. yeah like a like a healthy uh, ability to to reframe your perspective yeah my uh co-op teacher when i was student teaching in college um i remember uh, one of the best advice uh, that I received from him is that you gotta yeah teach the best that you can like do the best job that you can to uh, uplift someone uh, that you're teaching using uh, or through music because at some point in their lives you don't you, you're probably not going to be training the next Mozart you know or you're not <laughs> you're not going to be training the next whatever like greatest musician whatsoever but you could potentially uh, be training a kid who is going to end up um, making decisions about cutting the arts, for example, or supporting the arts. And uh, I, yeah, I took that to heart. Yeah, it's just true. Like a lot of kids, they do drop out after high school. Um, some of them don't pursue music at all in college and all these other things. And yeah, they do end up being that parent. And when I say that parent, okay, I'm going to give you $1,000 to your program because you guys are doing such an amazing job with my kid. I'm like, yes, thank you. You know, and like, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. And um. I, yeah, so I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, the, the examples, I, I feel like the, the, it must be helpful for, for music students to see examples of the less mainstream or less cliche outcomes of uh, uh, music having a success in their life. So besides getting into like a top orchestra or uh, besides being like a rock star, like um, it, it, it must be really helpful to know, for example, Preston, that you can, you can play sounds for video games. Like that's like, that's like an option that you can, you can get into. Yeah. It's definitely the, the easiest way to get a young kid to buy into trumpet lessons. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I would tell them like I, you know, I spent five years in the Nashville Symphony and I got to play in Carnegie Hall and it's like okay, cool. It's like well, I played on the soundtrack to Call of Duty. It's, what? And then you know, <laughs> then they're hooked, you know. So it it helps it helps my career for sure. Uh, I will say just a little brief thing about that. I while I am on all those soundtracks, I play third trumpet primarily for a living. Uh, and this is I'm going to kind of throw this to Neil as sort of a question, but. I know that when I was in school, the perception was your second and your third parts, you're on those parts because you're a lesser musician, right? As we get older and older, we learn that, well, that was a really stupid way of thinking about it. And <laughs> it's really critical to have the section. So we have the, the blend. And so I'm, I'm never the quarterback, you know, the guys that I play for that play first, like they get all the hero moments, but I like to think of myself as that left tackle, right? I'm blocking for them. So they get those moments. So my question for you is, how do you how do you get your young kids to buy into that concept? Um, I actually, so I, it's a pretty cool system that I have, I think, um, where my eighth graders, the oldest ones in the class, they're usually the more experienced ones, also the better players. Um, I would tell them things like, uh, I actually don't care if you play well. Like, I, I know it sounds weird, but like, I care when you guys all play well. And so I would have them essentially take somebody under their wing uh, and say like, so who, out of the sixth and seventh graders, like who in that trumpet section do you feel you can mentor and make sure that they also get to your spot once you leave? 
So what mm -hmm. legacy are you leaving behind? So that's essentially like uh, a thing. I, I call it the uh, Music Student Leadership Council. Like, so I, I yeah, it's like uh, <laughs> our, our version of tri -M. Yeah. And so, um, and uh, yeah, we, we have kids essentially mentoring the younger ones, making sure that once they leave, someone takes over their spot. And, and it's just this brotherhood or sisterhood kind of thing. And they're looking out for each other. They know that they're responsible for each other. And it's not just them playing and making sure that they alone can play well. Nobody cares. Like, <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really, uh, I, I never, I've never heard of that, frankly. That's a really great idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that goes back also to the community uh, motivation, like how, how it comes back to the relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it's, it's so human. Yeah. Um, Did we want to answer uh, Christina's question here real quick? So I have you guys supported. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cause that one, I'm interested to hear what others also have to say about it. Yeah. Yeah. So Christina asks, how have you guys supported your students with low self-esteem during the pan pandemic and what more can we do uh, if there is more disconnection amongst, what can we do if there's more disconnection amongst our younger generation now? Well, one of the things that um, I, try to do as much as possible um, during the pandemic and teaching during the pandemic is was to maintain the connections between the students because they're not seeing each other and i feel like the when you are studying music it's really your peers that can help you build that self-esteem through supporting each other and um, especially our music department really did a great job before in building this really strong community of and very supportive community and then all of a sudden it was gone just like that and everyone was just stuck alone and um you know, my students, since we're a community college and we're in, you know, a very urban area, underserved population, uh, so they had a lot of outside of school stress that they were dealing with. And a lot of them really felt alone and felt that they weren't able to keep up with their musical practice that they could before and their you know self-esteem was really struggling as a result so i really tried to create scenarios where they could connect with each other um you know through discussions we would have just you know coffee hours, we would call them, or hangouts where we would just have it open and have people come and um, talk to each other. And also, you know, when I was bringing in guests to talk to my students, one of the great things about it is hearing from musicians that they can look up to who are successful and working and doing all of these great things and hearing from them that when they were their age, they had absolutely no idea either what they were doing <laughs> and um, that it's normal. And even people who continue to not know what they were doing for many years, you know, throughout college throughout grad school even you know now they're doing a bunch of things and they're telling the students that you know a lot of it was just going out and trying every day and you know taking that road wherever life sort of decided to take them and i think that that has been really beneficial for our students who are just starting their kind of undergraduate career and not really sure if they're going to be able to make it in music to hear from other people who felt the same way and you know made it and are doing really well mm -hmm. um. 
I guess uh, I'll say I'll say something, but then I'll have to leave because my student has just arrived. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I I absolutely agree with what you said. Is, is that connection and having them to know, know like, yeah, you you're not alone in in the situation. Um, I think I think. Uh, Another another way of 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 uh, helping them with low self esteem is, is that you is is I notice that if if I, I try to close the door if if in the lesson and, and uh, noticing then that the student has low self esteem and be too conscious about their existence. Um, I, I I use one phrase that would almost always work is that um, music has been around forever, no matter what is going to be here. And uh, you are the one who makes music. Um, so so in this very room, in this very time and space, nobody else makes better music than you. And uh, you have the control over that and it has nothing um, to do with what is outside. It's, it's like a little comfort bubble if, um, if you wish for it to be one. Um, and this bubble is magical because if you want that to reach out, it's, it's definitely doable too. And, and so, so um, having that comfort zone in them, knowing, knowing that, um, they are able to to not bring the outside world to to their music making um, versus the absolute extreme of completely bringing their music to the outside world. Um, I think I think uh, that that is that is a uh, they they find it quite comforting. I think, and then they're able to just let go for a moment of what's happening outside. And then they could just focus on the music and then go back and realizing, oh, okay, what I did just now actually is related to the outside world. Yeah, so that moment of peace and quiet, I think, uh, yeah, would benefit not, not only just to, not only to them, but to me as well, I feel. Because our, our expectation for students have to no, there's no doubt um, is is connected to how we connect it with our teachers. We we are so much affected by the way we are taught, and so if if for a moment we can break that little, put a wall on that for 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 just that maybe fifteen minutes or even one hour, that would be good enough. Yeah, yeah that's so really cool. That's a cool. little thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That phrase really, I mean, even just hearing it from you now, like not, not, not even as a student, like I can feel like how I would just come into the moment instead of being all in my head and worrying about my comparisons and all these things. Yeah. yeah. Really I really cool. enjoy this little hour bubble right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so much. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, it's, a, it's a really good yeah. food for thought moment um, that we're sharing every day. Yeah. But I guess I have to go now. I'm really sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. no worries, no worries. <laughs> okay. yeah, well. Nice seeing you all. I hope we'll do this again. Okay, bye. Yeah. It was great to see yeah. you again. Bye. Yeah, have fun. Bye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Caroline and I actually have to go to, we have to go soon, <laughs> if that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, we went, we went quite a bit over. Um, yeah, we can we can wrap it up. Um, let's see. Uh, well, we have a question from Kaishin. Uh, I personally suffer from low self esteem. What actually inspired me, like how Katie said, music was my comfort zone. And those problems that I could actually solve in the long run. There was also somebody who said, "Focus on music, on yourself." I thought that really hit me hard. Okay, so it wasn't really a question; it was an affirmation. Um, well said, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I heard someone, um, another harpist, the other day, 
we were talking about um, performance anxiety. And she said that what really helped her was realizing that every time she went up to perform, she was giving the audience something. And it was a gift to them. And um, she, you know, tries to focus on that instead of the possibility of them judging her, which mm -hmm. I thought was really great also. And my old teacher always used to say that it's just music, not world peace. <laughs> yeah no yeah that's true <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's 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 just it's interesting how how the culture around music training it's or at least classically or, or traditionally it's it's so serious so, <laughs> oh, hello. Hi, Natalie. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, your three has entered the game. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I think we can, yeah, we can, we can definitely, we can wrap it up here. I think there is, there's a, there's a ton that I learned, um, and especially these last few quotes, it's just music and not world peace. <laughs> um, so, so good. And then also in, in, in this moment here, in this space and time, you're the only music maker. Ah, so pretty. <laughs> Great That's job. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so expressive. <laughs> Clearly, she's very, very introverted. <laughs> well, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for, for your time, uh, especially so, so late at night. Um, was great this was, yeah this is a lot of thank fun. you for putting this together it was lovely to meet uh caroline and neil and and i learned a lot too this was awesome i hope we do it again yeah yeah thank you guys and thanks christina and aaron yeah. and the whole team as thank always. you everyone thank you have a good night over there thank have you a good, um, <laughs> morning for the rest of the participants <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you. See you guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.